platform, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Mark Canny. I'm the manager of lending services at Lehigh University and the host for today's event. Our folio topic today is what's new in resource access. And we're happy to have here today our convener for the resource access special interest group, Andrea Loyman from Duke University, and several of our product owners in resource access. Anya Arnold from EBSCO, Emma Betcher from the University of Chicago, and Tanya Fersenheim from Fenway Library Organization. Today's session, like all folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted. And we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage with us on the topic. Use the Q&A box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come up. Uh, generally, we'll handle the Q&A and discussion in the last portion of the presentation after uh, the POs have, have, have shown their, their content. The speakers will address the questions at the end. If you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the discussion on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. And we'll begin with Andrea at Duke. Welcome, Andrea. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Andre Leugman. I'm the head of access and delivery services at Duke University and the convener of the Folio's Resource Access Special Interest Group. Uh, to catch up a bit on what that means, um, the structure of the SIG is fairly straightforward. We're a group of access services practitioner, practitioners uh, known as the subject matter experts, or SMEs for short, um, and several product owners and UX UI designers. Membership in the SIG has changed slightly over the year and a half that we've been meeting, but we are currently made up of a dozen SMEs from 10 different libraries, six product owners, and two UX designers. Um, our SMEs come from small, mid-sized, and large libraries, some part of expansive consortia, others are standalone. But between us, the SMEs have got decades of knowledge of access services functionality and experience with more than a dozen ILSs. Our role as subject matter experts has been to take all that history and knowledge and introduce, describe, and discuss what we really want from a library management system. Our product owners, POs for short, um, all of whom have library backgrounds, help us to focus our questions and then take our ideas and concerns to the developers. And then they come back to us more, with more questions. They also bring us wireframes, screenshots, and early development so we have visual tools to make sure that we're all headed in the same direction. When extra work on a more focused aspect of access services functionality has been needed, we've spun off subgroups to work on things like patron notices and course reserves. Those subgroups, each with a specific PO, are made up of both regular SIG members and other librarians with interests in the area. Those subgroups may be short-lived, um, you know, they finish their work and move on. For me, it's been amazing to watch this process unfold and to see what we've all managed to accomplish so far. We think that some of our pro approaches have been quite innovative and that while we know that others are tried and true, you're about to hear from three of our product owners who will tell you about some of it. I'm particularly enthusiastic about the way that we've envisioned item statuses that Emma is going to discuss with you. Um, but before I pass you all along to her, I do want to encourage you to join us. We can always use more smart people to help us think about better ways to do this. You can see um, access us through the wiki space that's listed on the screen in front of you. Um, and or come along and join us for our Zoom meetings, uh, which are Mondays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, and now I'm going to hand you to Emma. 
All right, thanks, Andrea. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen, so you should be seeing my slides soon. Um, share and now present. Um, so hello again, my name is Emma Betcher and I am the product owner for loans. And before I give you a little tour of what that looks like in the system to date, I wanted to give an overview of some of the discussions to come out of the resource access SIG in the past few months, where a major topic of discussion has been how Folio will handle item status. And while not all of this is in development yet, we did arrive at a consensus earlier in the summer. And so that's what I'll be sharing with you today. Um, I'll start by taking us back to spring of this year, around early March, where at that point we only had two statuses in the system, available and checked out, because that's what we needed to have when the checkout and check-in apps were developed. Status was only one field, and at that point the values it could have were mutually exclusive, both within Folio and in real life. An item could not be both available and checked out. And when we started trying to build on that model, at first it seemed easy to continue to add uh, mutually exclusive values to that field, things like lost or missing or recently returned. But we ran into a challenge as we started to describe that an item was also requested. The first thought was to compound this information in the same field, which meant that for every status like available, there would actually need to be as many versions of that statuses as there were types of requests depending on how granular we were in describing the type of request. And that meant that the number of statuses was going to grow very quickly. It also meant that every time the SIG discussed something new, like lost or missing, we'd have to ensure that different versions of it were hard-coded in the system to account for the different types of requests. Another disadvantage is that compounding all these values together didn't make it easy to reuse their commonalities in the system. And what I mean by that is that even though statuses like available, available requested, and available recalled, all of those commonality in real life, and they look related to the human user, um, to compound the request and the checked out um, elements of the status together in one field meant that each status would be coded uniquely and that the Folio backend wouldn't necessarily be able to see them as related leading to inefficiencies in how loan rules were written and then how different statuses related to each other, among other things. And related to both of those disadvantages, it seemed like the approach was also going to make it more difficult to add custom statuses to the system way down the line. Because again, you'd have to create different versions of those statuses based on whether items were requested and define behavior and rules based around each of those statuses as well, treating them as unique. And while custom status functionality isn't in imminent development, we were aware that this compound approach made it difficult to plan for and describe within the system all of the real world states that an item can be in, including ones that were unique to particular institutions. So after discussing this at great length, we realized that we needed a new model that could still describe where an item was and what it was needed for, but doing so in a way that was more flexible. It seemed like the best approach then was not to consolidate these pieces of information all in one field, but instead to take a more modular approach with separate fields to describe the components of a state that the item is in. In discussions with the SIG, we've referred to these components as availability, needed for, and process. And I'll go through and explain a little bit more about what these are. Uh, the first part of an item state availability is the answer to the question, where is this item or can it be checked out? Myself, I tend to phrase it as who is responsible for this item? But the common factor in all those questions is really just the present tense. It's talking about where the item is currently. And in that sense, I think it's probably similar to the system's use of the word status. An item always is assigned an availability, even if that's on order. And during its lifetime, an item's availability might also change to indicate that it's available or checked out or missing, lost in transit. It refers to item's present state without saying anything about where it'd be going next. And so far, this is looking probably pretty similar to how we'd previously started out talking about status. 
but the change comes in when we bring in how requests are folded into this. Requests and whether or not an item is requested is answering a different question from availability. Availability answers a question about where an item currently is, but requests answers a question about what an item is going to do in the future. And because those questions are so different, it seemed worth separating them out into different fields so that the system can make more intelligent decisions about what different states had in common. So at first, um, this field started off as just repeating the type of request, recall or hold or paging, but that seemed redundant with the information that was already in the request itself. And so then from there, we considered reducing it down to the binary of, is this item requested or is it not requested, just to avoid having that redundancy. But patron requests aren't the only thing that indicates what an item is going to do in the future. So the field expanded again to encompass a more general view of what an item could be needed for. It might be needed for patron requests, but an item can also be needed for reserves or needed for cataloging review. This needed for field, as we've been calling it in discussion, can describe any of the things an item needs to go do in the future. And since in the real world, an item can be needed for multiple things, like reserves, needed for patron requests, and digitization, um, unlike availability, this is something that's a repeatable field. We've heard from the SIG that at the very least, there needs to be a logical order as well to how these things are fulfilled instead of just saying that the entity that said it needed it first is going to get it first. And so at the very least, we might be looking at implementing a set order that first we're going to see if it's needed for reserves and then to see if it's needed for any patron requests and then needed for cataloging review, for example. And then from there, letting institutions either create their own order or override in particular cases. And then the last component of an item state is that if we're describing that an item is needed for different staff processes, we also have to describe when something is in a particular process. Otherwise, the system doesn't know when the item, when the process is fulfilled and when the item should be moving on to the next thing that it's needed for. An item can only be in one process at a time. And like availability, that's partly driven by where an item is in physical space. I anticipate that in most cases, an item with any process state would have its availability just reduced down to being in process, whether the process is cataloging, preservation, reserves, or some other thing. Although I think that there are probably exceptions to that rule where process and availability, availability would contradict. So it's not a strict hierarchical relationship where process is just a of availability. And I know that this is all probably sounding very theoretical, so I'm also going to go through some examples just to help hopefully make things clearer. The simplest example is what we started with, which is that an item starts out maybe as available and then it's checked out to the patron. Its availability becomes checked out. When the patron returns the item, uh, the staff member checks it in and its availability changes again to recently returned. But in this simple interaction, needed for and process aren't affected at all. It's only the availability for the item that's changing through the interactions. Of course, this gets complicated a little bit more if while that item is checked out, another patron recalls the item. So in this case, the item is checked out to the patron, its availability becomes checked out, and then when it's recalled, the availability is to stay checked out, but now the system knows that it's needed for a patron request. So it's keeping track of the fact that the item needs to go somewhere or do something when checked back in. And then when that um, item is checked back in, the availability becomes a waiting pickup and the needed for having been satisfied no longer appears on the item. And you'll also see in this column that the need for isn't actually tracking who made the request or the request expiration date or the type of request it is or the pickup location. All of that information is elsewhere on the request itself. 
and but needed for is mostly allowing for that patron request to be considered alongside other staff processes that might need the item. It's not quite the same thing as the request queue itself. In another scenario, the item might be checked out to the patron. And then instead of being recalled by another patron, it's identified as being needed for some staff process. And here's where all three components of an item state might get involved. So it's, um, it's checked out to the patron, availability becomes checked out. The staff indicate that they need it for some cataloging process. And the availability stays checked out, but then the, the needed for changes to cataloging. And then once the item is checked back in, the needed for is fulfilled. So it goes into that process of cataloging. And that in turn, oops, sorry. And that in turn affects the um, availability to be in process because it is in this process of cataloging. Instead of having its availability upon being checked back in, just go to recently returned. So we could expand this into any number of speculations and combinations, but the one I wanted to end on is just to show where, um, an item, where an item could have multiple needed for. So in this scenario, the item is checked out to the patron, its availability starts as checked out, and staff indicated it for cataloging, like in the last example. And then a patron decides to recall the item as well. So the availability throughout all this stays as checked out, but now it has needed for of cataloging patron request. And well then once the item is checked back in, and instead of just fulfilling that first in, first out order, the system would know that the patron request is more important than the cataloging review, according to some logic put in. And so then it's going to be changed to awaiting pickup. The patron request is dropped from the needed for, although cataloging is going to stay on, so that when eventually it does get returned and there aren't any more patron requests on it, they'll be able to fulfill that cataloging process. So in this model, we're not trying to reduce the complexity of the real world. I'm just trying to put it in terms that the system and its users can understand. The degree of granularity allows an item's whereabouts to be pinpointed and having that automatic handoff between needed for and process ensures that the items don't get trapped in loops where they're fulfilling the same processes over and over, which is sometimes the case when systems are only using item notes to track that sort of thing. And separating these three components of state into different parts kind of makes them into building blocks to describe different co combinations of availability and needed for and process. And that'll be a little easier to define transitions between those states as new ones emerge. From the technical side, one thing Folio emphasizes is that it's a collection of apps. And separating out this information also limits the amount of information that each app has to know. It might only have to know things about what an item is needed for or about what process it's in, but not necessarily have to know anything about the item's availability. And we're hoping that that can make things simpler from a development perspective as well. And in the long run for Folio, we're also hoping that this modular approach will be able to help when eventually users are able to set up custom states and write custom workflows. I'm not the product owner for that, not an expert on it by any means, but having these components separate from each other, in particular having that separate process, uh, means that adding custom transitions between these things um, should be easier and that custom workflows can be considered processes that just happen to be added to the system. As I said, that's mostly in the long run, but in the immediate future, there's still a lot to discuss in the SIG. So I'll echo um, Andrea's um, invitation that if you're interested in joining, you're more than welcome. Right now we've got this framework and we've got a goal, but not necessarily um, something that's implemented in the system. Some of these topics are things that the product owners and developers will be discussing, and some of them are also going to be discussed within the SIG itself as we continue to discuss requirements for this. We're still continuing to determine what states we need under availability. 
Folio being an agile project, we didn't start with the full list of states from the beginning to implement. Instead, we're working based off of features and introducing these new states as they come up, new states and new um, under availability as they come up in discussion. We're also figuring out how to handle transitions between the states and what the necessary requirements are there. How long a needed for stays on an item? Can a process be triggered by something other than a needed for? How are different needed for and processes applied? And can a process be skipped and returned to later? These are all things that are going to require input from both developers and from the state as we discuss the requirements. And then one final thing we have to discuss is how the interface displays all of this. And this is kind of my excuse for being able to give you also a quick tour of Lowe's during this forum for those of you that were wondering when you're going to see something besides the slide. So I'm going to run through the checkout and check-in interaction pretty quickly, just so that you can see the different places that status currently shows up in them, how we might be discussing that, and get an overview of loans in general. So with that, I'm gonna exit my slides for now and go over into um, Folio Snapshot Stable, which is the demo system I'm going to be using today. Right now I'm in an inventory app looking at an item record. And you'll see here that it displays the item status as being available. And it also shows that the item does, um, doesn't have any requests. If it did, it shows the number of patron requests that were on the item. So one thing we'll have to be discussing is how does process display on the screen, if at all. Are we going to include other needed for on the screen besides just patron requests? Um, that's all information that's helpful to show about an item. And the question is how do we display that where? For right now though, I'm just gonna grab this barcode up here so I can demonstrate um, a checkout and check-in process. If I go over into the checkout app, don't have a particular user in mind, so I'll just Pick one of the first one that shows up. So now I've got their patron information over here on the left, and I can enter the barcode on this side of the screen. And a couple of things about the interaction that are relevant to our discussion of availability and needed for and process. And the first is that if an item was needed for something or in a particular process and you tried to check it out to someone, you might expect the system to notify you of that or warn or maybe even prevent you in some cases. For now though, the checkout has gone through successfully. And you'll notice that actually um, very little information about the item status displays on the screen. I think this is a good example of how we are looking at this um, slightly more complex depiction of status and item state. It doesn't necessarily need to have its full complexity revealed at every turn. Right now in the checkout app, once a checkout has gone through, the item status is going to be checked out. And so it's not, um, it wasn't determined that it was necessary to show the status on that screen. Same with requests. While you might want to be warned about the existence of requests as you're checking out the item to the patron, once that checkout goes through successfully, it's not, it's probably not necessary to see the number of requests because it's, the item is just going off to this current patron now. If we go back to the patron's open loans though, and I'll use this link over in the sidebar here to get to their open loans. Right now they've only got this one checked out. That information about item status and requests or availability and needed for becomes a lot more relevant because as you're looking at this screen, the questions become more like, huh, I wonder why I can't renew this item or why did this item's due date change? In which case, knowing more information about the item's availability and needed for can be really relevant. The same topic that we're discussing in the context of inventory. I'll also point out, and this is new from those of you um, who saw the demo last at WolfCon, that you can renew on this screen and also change due date as a new feature as well. Um, won't go through that full interaction, but I'll point out that it is there at this point. And if we go into the loan details itself, again, that combination of fields of the item status and the number of requests would show up. I'll have to determine uh, what 
those are changed to or how they're adapted to fit the availability needed for process model. But then lastly, to go back to checking this item back in, I'll enter the, the check-in app and scan the barcode. And like the checkout app, this is a place where the item state is transitioning between two different states. So you might want to be warned or notified about the thing that's supposed to happen next to the item. Again, it doesn't have to be the full iceberg. It can just be at the tip of it to show what um, is needed for the patron or sorry, the user checking in this item just to know immediately what to do next with this item. It doesn't have to reveal the full complexity of the system. Right now it's set up that it does show the item status so that you'll know if it is available or in transit or if it's flipped to something like in process under that availability needed for an in process model. So that's pretty much what I have to share about the item states. Uh, thank you for staying with me through what was a fairly theoretical presentation. Although, like I said, I'm looking forward to discussing a lot of the questions I mentioned today with the RAC group. If you have any questions for me, there will be time at the end of the forum. But for now, I'm going off to Tanya, who's a product owner for requests. And Tanya, I'll stop sharing my screen and let you take over. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I believe it's still morning for everybody. Um, I'm going to get into presentation mode and share my screen. All right, so um, I, as uh, Emma just and Andrea uh, mentioned, I'm the product owner for requests and we are uh, currently in the um, process of um, being in a subgroup to try to tackle um, specific request type things in a, you know, sort of a rapid smaller group type situation. My subgroup members are from several different libraries. Um, I've listed them up here on the screen and they've been um, absolutely critical to this process along with um, the members of the full SIG. I think between the two of these groups, um, we're making huge strides in the requesting area of the system. This is the topics I'm going to uh, cover today. Um, I'll say up front that in many respects, requests are a very workaday area of a library system. Um, some of what I'm going to be talking about today is very standard requests and requesting is an area that's rarely flashy or radical, but requesting is a critical function for most libraries. So our goal is to build the best request app possible. And um, the resource access SIG members and the request subgroup members um, have contributed and are continuing to contribute a large variety of perspectives. We're continually gathering and weighing what has worked well in our traditional ILSs and what hasn't worked well and also the kinds of things that we wish existed. So I'll move on to request types. Again these are um, fairly standard. Um, Emma covered quite a bit of how requests are an important category of needed for in terms of the item state and how items move through the system um, and are triggered for various things. Each of the uh, types of request um, represents a needed for of request, uh, but they're created for different reasons and they trigger and affect different things within the system. For holds, um, hold requests are for an item which is currently not available, um, either it's on order or it's uh, currently on loan to another borrower, but it's an item that this, the patron is not necessarily interested in getting back any quicker than, hey, the next time it comes into the library, I'd like you to, to either hold it for me or deliver it to me. Recalls are, uh, like re hold requests, they are for an item which is currently on loan and the patron wants it sooner than 
you know, whenever it next comes back into the library. And most systems and most libraries choose to um, shorten a loan period for the current borrower, letting them know that they need to bring it back sooner than they were originally expecting. Um, and with all the attendant notices and other things that goes with that. A paging request um, is a request for an item that's available. I know a lot of libraries, including my local public library, um, have a, uh, a service where they will pull things for you from OpenStax uh, if you just place a request on them and then let you know when they're available to pick up. But also paging requests are important for closed stack situations, uh, an environment where a patron is not actually um, allowed to go into the stacks and pull something for themselves. Remote storage requests are similar to a paging request, but um, the system needs to interoperate with, you know, an offsite storage or automated storage and retrieval system. Um, it's a little more complex than simply a page where a person's going to walk to the stacks and get something. Um, you're often needing to tell a robotic storage system that needs something pulled and sent along. Resource sharing, um, I guess, is also sort of similar to a paging request, but in the case of resource sharing, you're interoperating with third-party interlibrary loan systems like Iliad, Relay, etc. And then finally, um, we have the concept of staff work-related requests, and they kind of could be similar to any of the any of the above. It could be placed on an item that is currently checked out. It could be placed on an item that's sitting on the shelf. And, um, you know, because it needs to go into some sort of staff process, like course reserves preparation, book repair, etc. Um, depending on the nature of what the item is needed for, this type of request may have a higher or lower priority than other types. For example, reserves processing usually gets the highest priority in most libraries um, in terms of whether or not something can go out to someone else or can be requested by someone else. When it needs to go on reserve, reserves kind of um, ends up being the, the winner in all of those situations. Um, our vision, uh, we're envisioning that the staff work-related requests are one of the ways in which an item can land itself in a process, which um, Emma had had talked about. And there's a possibility uh, that we haven't actually worked this out yet. This is a little bit in the future, staff work related requests are a little bit in the future, that these kinds of um, processes and how you trigger something to be in a staff work related request may be defined and um, managed in a, in a workflow app or workflow engine. Request fulfillment options. Again, this is very standard. Uh, we're we're building in two different fulfillment options, one for pickup and one for delivery. I know that not all libraries um, are interested in delivering things to patrons, but um, you know, pickup is you know defined as it's going to be at a particular service point on the hold shelf, and the patron will be let, let uh, will be told it's okay to come get it. And delivery is um, delivery to a non-library location, like a faculty's member of faculty member's office, or mailed to someone who is um, studying remotely. And in either case, um, there will be a defined list of um, options for where something can be picked up or where something can be delivered to and that's going to be definable by the library itself instead of um, you know just dictated for you. Requesting by proxy um, is an extension of uh, the concept of loaning by proxy where you know a the classic case of this is a grad student is, a spon is sponsored by a faculty and acts as a proxy member for that faculty member and uh, can come into the library and borrow things on that on their sponsor's behalf. And um, the extension of this into requests is that we are um, having an option about whether or not someone can request for a specific proxy. So can this person place requests for their sponsor or is this a situation where the sponsor does not want them to be able to place requests but maybe only wants them to come in and, and physically borrow things for them. So this is um, a mock-up of what that looks like when someone is actually 
well, actually, when a staff member is placing a request on behalf of someone and asking whether or not this person is acting as themselves or is acting on behalf of one of their proxies. This person, you can see in the mock-up, has multiple, um, is proxy for multiple sponsors. And uh, Jonathan Matthews, this person is, is allowed to request on behalf of Jonathan Matthews. But their, their user record is set to not allow them to request on behalf of the other sponsor. So in this case, the system says, all right, I will let you request on behalf of Jonathan Matthews, but I'm not going to let you request on behalf of um, Libby Cronin. The request queue is an area where we've been doing a lot of work in terms of how we architect the uh, request itself and the queue and how we define for the system um, what position something is in so that um, the you know folio knows in what order to fill a request when an item is acted upon. At the moment, um, it's currently first in, first out, with the oldest request being number one. We're still working on things like um, how you were going to reorder the queue so that if something is a higher priority than another request, um, perhaps uh, it's needed rush to go um, to a faculty member, uh, but there's a couple of requests above theirs in the queue, the ability to shuffle it to the top of the queue so that that one gets uh, filled first. And we're also working on things like um, bulk actions, things like the ability to select a bunch of requests and cancel them all at once which I understand is a popular thing to do sometimes. It's sort of one of those things where maybe you don't have to do it all the time, but that moment when you do have to cancel 15 requests on a particular item, it's going to be really nice to be able to do them um, in bulk. So request policies is where I think Folio actually has an opportunity to be a little bit radical and a little bit sparkly um, and maybe slightly outside the standard requesting um, rules that our traditional ILSs let us set up. Its essence, you know, its essence, request policies are about who can place a request, what can be requested, what type of request can a person place, and what fulfillment options might be available to them. You know, is someone, a bit, is someone allowed to have something delivered to them, or are they only allowed to have something placed on the hold shelf for them to come pick up? I know a lot of places, um, you know, students, it would be fairly rare for a student to have something delivered to them, but certainly they can have something held for them on uh, a hold shelf. So, the uh, okay. So at the, the basic, the most basic level, it's about who a person is. Um, you know what what sort of uh, category they're in. Are they faculty? Are they grad student? Are they um, an undergrad? Are they staff? And the item type. What kind of item it is? It's a DVD. It's a book. It's a map. Um, and the intersection of those two things, in essence, is what allows a request to be created. But it's actually, you know, a little more complicated than that in almost every system I know of, because item state also needs to figure in. Um, and uh, Emma talked a lot about item state and how an item state is derived. And an item state is, you know, is something checked out? Is it currently in a process somewhere? Is it on order? Those kinds of things definitely feed into whether or not you want a, you know, person A to be able to request item B. Uh, but it's even more complex than that. Um, we went through a process of discussing what kinds of things might affect whether or not a library wants to allow a request by patron A on item B. So patron group, item type, item state, those are pretty standard. Patron status is also very standard. It's, um, you know, are they, uh, do they owe too much money? Um, is their record expired? Are they about to graduate? That kind of thing. Um, item needed for, you know, is it needed for something else? Um, and does it being needed for something else, like, for example, reserves, mean that we're not interested in letting additional requests be placed on it? Um, because, you know, in the, in the case of reserves, if someone wants something um, in the next week or so, if that thing is currently needed for reserves, 
and is gonna is about to go into reserves processing chances are you you may not want that person to place the request because they're not going to get it in time um, in a timely fashion for them to be able to uh, actually use the item because it's actually going onto the reserve shelf and item location was another interesting one that came up um, the concept of items that may be in a particular location are or are not requestable. For example, something that is on display for a special exhibit. Maybe there are situations where you don't want people to be able to place requests on something that's in um, in a uh, a special exhibit, or you know you may not want to allow them to uh, recall it or page it, but you might want them to place be able to place the kind of request where they just say, okay, when this thing comes out of a special exhibit, I would like to get my hands on it. So all of those things together are what really determines whether or not a request is allowed. Um, so, you know, the, the combination of those things, Folio will say, okay, yes, this, I'm going to allow you to place that request. But there's a whole lot of other questions that it needs to be asking you or itself um, about when I'm allowing this request, what you know, am I allowed to, am I going to allow uh, this type of request or that type of request? Am I going to allow this to be delivered or only picked up? Um, where is it, where could it be picked up? There may be items that uh, you don't want traveling far and wide in your system. Um, you'd like them to only be picked up at their home location. Where could it be delivered to? Whether or not you want to adjust the due dates. Um, and if something's being picked up, what the hold shelf duration is. You know, something that is only a three-day loan, you may not want to let it sit on the hold shelf for seven days um, before somebody comes to pick it up. You may want that to be shorter than a standard six-month loan um, item. <laughs> Okay, our next steps. Um, we're still working on the architecture of how request policies are going to be defined and how they'll be applied. It's fairly complex because there's a lot of interactions with other things like loan policies and fine fees and notices. Um, so, you know, we're still working on how this architecture is actually going to look. Um, so that's another, that's a big topic of conversation at the moment. And we're also working on how to handle interruptions to the standard flow of a request. So, you know, the simplest case is somebody places a request, the item comes into the library, it becomes a way to pick up, it gets checked out to the person who requested it, and then eventually they bring it back. We all know that there are times that that isn't the case. Something may come in and become a waiting pickup, but you need to give it to somebody else for a while. How do we um, handle that interruption so that the person who requested it and who for whom it was a waiting pickup is going to still get it after you've after you've done this other thing to it, sent it here or sent it there. So that's these these are probably the two biggest and most important things that we're currently talking about um, in the SIG dis in our SIG discussions. So. Um, thanks for listening to me talk about requests and um, if you have any questions definitely put them in the chat and we'll tackle those at the end and I am going to stop sharing so that I can hand off to Anya and it always takes me a long time to figure out how to stop sharing might be this little X hmm. That's not it. It's down at the bottom. Who remembers how to stop sharing? Oh, come on, folks, really? <laughs> if you mouse well, over the top, is there, um, does the toolbar come down that says stop share? Ah, there we go. Oh, somebody stole it. Thank you. <laughs> I always, I always have this problem. Thanks a lot, everybody. I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Anya Arnold and I am the PO for courses and I am assuming that you can see my screen. Um, so when we think about courses, we also think about course reserves and so, but we've changed it a little bit to just be courses. Um, our subgroup team members are listed here, Andrea, Yarmo, Mike, Priera. Ricky, Tanya, and Wendy, and they have been instrumental in helping me determine what is going on in, in reserves and all the different systems that are out there and helping to create a new system. 
currently in Folio, there are inherent um, features that already help reserves um, or for items that are on reserve for things that are not tied to classes. And those things are the ability to change um, locations to temporary locations, such as a reserve location, um, the ability to change the type of item, and the ability to create an item record, um, for instance, for instructor-owned items. And also, we can adjust loan rules. Um, so these things are very important and are already built. And if you are using Atlas um, systems, you can um, use Aries with these things already um, designed. But if you don't have Aries, there is a need for Folio to, to take up that. So we've started talking about courses as a module. So sometimes you'll hear reserves or course reserves or courses. Um, and, and really what we're talking about is here is items that are attached to classes and tracking those classes and items. So we are creating a new module in Folio called courses. Um, you'll log into Folio and you'll see a new icon for courses and you'll click on the screen and you'll come up with something that looks like this. Um, right now we only have screenshots because we're just in that phase of writing developments and getting screens. Um, so, so you'll be able to come in and see that there are, you know, 345 courses or, you know, and you can search for things here. Um, and you can filter based off of term and statuses and service desk. In the future, we're hoping to have um, a Boolean search set that can also um, do cross-list coursing, course number, course name department, um, instructor taught by, and service desk. And that will look something like this. So in the search, you'll have, oh, I'm gonna search by course code and maybe um, department and then maybe time and then the term. So th those are things that we're hoping to create. Now, if you're adding a course, you would hit the new button at the top of this right hand side and you would start to enter in information about the course itself, about the actual program and you would enter your course name, department, course code, section, register ID, external ID, um, maybe enrollment num numbers if you have it. Now, we all know that courses um, could be listed more than once or have credit in more than one department or have different names. Um, so we have built in a another button underneath this big thing that says cross-listed course number. Um, and then you can add as many cross-listed events um, or courses that this single course is referred to. So this is the same instructors, the same attendees, the same time period, but it's listed more than once. And here um, is an, an added, um, add more courses or add more cross-listed courses button. We also want to track who it's being taught by. And taught by is kind of, we're going to be searching in the users. So you can um, click on this little search key and it will pull up a search box that's for the users and you can select users and then um, hit enter for this. So we went with taught by because instructors could be professors, instructors, GTFs, and visitors. So we felt that that was a more generic term um, of things. Of course, you could just enter their name or barcode, but more than likely you'll be searching for them. 
once you find your courses, this is uh, your top by, this is how it will look in the system. You can edit it by clicking on the, the trash button um, and, and search for more. Also within the same course record, you need to determine um, what term or um, quarter. And so we've selected the term term to, to indicate the periods of time in which your classes are taught. So if you're on quarters or semesters or half quarters or half semesters, that is fine. Um, in a settings, you will determine what first of all you label your own term and you can predetermine what your start and end date are for that term and it will once you select say fall and it starts your normal courses starts on september 1st and go to you know december 21st um that will be that will be um, inserted in there however if you have a class that starts in the middle of that you could adjust that time here. There's also the location of the item, so what specific reference stacks or, or shelving the item is located, and the service desk in which the major, majority of the items will be serviced from. And then once you click you scroll down and select your location, you can then select your items from your inventory. If you have all of your items with you, you can scan your barcodes and it would appear in these cards. Um, or you can also do your searching from this screen as well. So here we're also trying to track copyright as well. So if the item requires copyright tracking, you can click on the item on that little indicator and then another portion of that card will appear. Does this item fall under fair use? Yes, no. Does this sometimes courses um, will use different sections of the same item and we have to track that. Um, is the copyright paid or not? Um, what's the total number of the pages of the item used um, and what's the percentage and what is the payment based on is it enrollment is it usage just what 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 really is that there and we're still working around out some of the details surrounding copyright we've also provided a space in which you could um, put a url or a pdf link um, into the card itself So a number of fields um, will be defaulted um, within this and so you'll have your item barcode. All of the stuff about the item will be there. However, you'll want to be able to change the temporary location, temporary loan type, processing status. Now processing status we just heard from Emma is going to change a little bit so our screenshots need to change. And again, here is where you have a different type of date, start and end date. Maybe an item is the professor only wants that particular item to be available for a week during the class. So here's where you can set the item or the date available for a particular item. So once your course is created, and everything is there. You can also send a message to your faculty members or, or who is teaching the class and let them know that the class is ready for them to start you know, advertising to their students or just let them know, hey, I have not received this copy from you and that's what we're waiting for. Um, so you can connect to the instructors right there. Um, we're also working on a way to export just a course information of their items here as well as um, as a broader thing so um, what was really determined to be very important from day one for courses is to have the ability to copy and edit um, courses and you can see here that there is the little copy and edit icons so copy would be used when this course 
is taught every fall and it's taught by the same people and it has the same items and instead of you know just keeping the same record you want to be able to determine um, chronologically what what term it's being used and and maybe usage so there are other things that you would want to see so an overly simple workflow um, you know, Miss B has just added a whole bunch of courses. She's attached um, items to those courses and she needs Mr. Honey to go find um, the items on the shelf so that she can process them. All right, so she does conducts a search, um, a basic search in, in the app and she selects all of the items or the courses in which she wants to um, export okay so once she's hit on this export item as CVS this screen appears and will coalesce all of the items that are in those courses and then she is able again here to select which items she needs um, she can say, I don't want anything um, that has a URL PDF as listed as a yes. Um, I don't want anything that has the status of um, checked out. So, so these are things that um, if it was checked out, you would do a different process such as maybe recall. Then she would click on export and this would export a CVS file um, the, which she can short, sort and give to Mr. Honey to go track down in the stacks um, and then normal processing would resume. So courses is, is still a work in progress. We, um, as you can see, we have screenshots, we have um, um, workflow, but we really want to know what, what is missing? Are we on the right track? Do you have any suggestions? we know that there are things that we need to think about such as um, how are we going to get requests or list of items that the professors want to place on reserve we need to understand how that process is going to go we need to understand how um, we'll be able to recall items um, or look up things and what if things are checked out? What do we do at that point? So we're in the process of gathering, um, you know, kind of user prompts. The team has been asked to kind of give me other tasks for Miss Honey to do and, and for, for Miss B so that we can understand in, in people terms what the system Need, needs to process. And we also need to collaborate with all of the PO um, owners that you've heard from today to make sure that requests and loans and um, item states um, are very much in line with each other so that it is as seamless as we can make it along with including more about E so that it's one place to connect E and P reserves together. A part of our requirements is to also be B, BLTI compliant or LTI compliant for learning management systems such as Blackboard or Canvas so that we could connect within um, those systems and be able to track from there. Um, with that, I believe um, it is question and answer time and I will go ahead and Stop sharing. Okay, could you leave that slide up? Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. So we're moving into the question portion of, of our presentation and we welcome uh, if you'd use the Q&A box. And I think the first question has to do with a uh, title or instant, instant level requests. So this would be for Tanya. Could a patron set a request on instant level instead of requesting a specific item copy so that the item which is being returned first is associated with this patron? Thank you. Um, okay, so first I will say that yes, instance level and holding level requesting are uh, very important things for us to be 
working on. We've working, we're working first on item specific requesting because it's critical for um, several functions, uh, notably some external uh, resource sharing systems require uh, item specific requesting. So that's the reason item specific is being worked on first. But we do know that both title or sorry, instance and uh, probably holding level are also um, critical things for us to queue up next after we have the item level uh, <coughs> requesting worked on. Does that help? Ben? Okay, thanks. Uh, a question for Anya about our course reserves, uh, and you may have alluded to this in the slides, but if you could uh, address it, um, is there a workflow for item fast ads if a professor brings an item to the desk? Right, so currently um, I've just been appointed within the last um, couple weeks to be the PO for um, fast ads, and Andrea and I are working with um, the cataloging um, SIG on, on how, how to actually do that. But yes, that is something that we envision. And there is the ability already to add items into inventory, but on the fly or fast ads um, is a bit like building an inventory record from the bottom up. Um, so, so we are in the process of working out what that re those requirements will be so that it is there. Okay, another question for courses. Um, is there a way for a library to load a list of courses and instructors into the courses app so that manual input is not necessary? Um, we have talked about this extensively and ideally um, yes, we, we want that and we have that built into our requirements for um, um, if we could, um, since I have control, right, I can go back. Um, if we looked at, um, here we go, so register ID and external ID. So we want to be able to autofill based off of the register ID or external ID information um, so that we don't have to autofill um, or we don't have to manually fill in courses. But right now um, we're trying to build what is actually needed. So there might be some manual entry at the very beginning and that it will um, eventually become more and more um, automated. So we, we are um, letting our developers know that this is a what we would like to see as soon as possible by adding these into our screenshots and our requirements. Okay, uh, here's a question for Emma about item states. Um, and you mentioned that in the in needed for, if there's multiple needed for, that the logic would be policy driven. Um, what about a case where you need to override the policy and manually reset a priority for a needed for? That's definitely something we still have to discuss. And it depends also on, I guess, a couple of questions I'd be asking as we discuss that is, when does that interaction need to happen for the person? Is it as the person checks it in? Is it ahead of time to say, I want to move my particular needed for that I'm setting at the moment up first in the queue? And there also would need to be a way then for the system to go back and satisfy the, the needed for that should have had priority after the first one has done. So being able to set different orders depending on, you know, usually this particular circumstance doesn't have a very high priority, but in this case for this item, it really does. Um, it's definitely something that we know that, that, that the system has to work on. It's also a little bit in the same boat as what Tanya was talking about with being able to do the request queue in that I think what we'll probably be working on first is just establishing that basic order through policies and then looking at being able to create exceptions to that later on as part of the development process. 
Okay, still time for questions and comments in the Q&A box. Um, I'll throw out uh, a general question for anyone who wants to pick it up. Um, you've shown us what you're currently working on, what the discussion and, and development priorities are. Um, what's on the horizon that you're looking forward to working on and, and what you maybe want to mention today? Um, okay, I can go first. <laughs> um, all right, so, you know, I think each of these things, well, a couple of these things are actually currently being worked on by uh, another PO, um, and I need to, we need to be collaborating with, with her, um, Darcy Branchini. Uh, slips and notices in relationship to requests are things that we are, um, uh, anxiously looking forward to um, being a little more in place so that the request subgroup can start talking about exactly what, uh, you know, what is needed in terms of both uh, data elements and also flexibility and configurability for something like, you know, a, a notice that goes to someone to tell them that their, their item is now waiting pickup for them. Um, and similarly, in-app reports is in sort of in the same boat of um, we're collaborating with an another um, another group but we're not you know actively collaborating at the moment and that's for in-app reporting things like the uh, production of a paging report that you take with you to the stacks to uh, pull things for people that um, have asked you to get things for them and then something that I think is a little less close on the horizon is um, we've been talking uh, in general in folio and resource access about advanced searching um, you know the ability to really get kind of uh, you know very um, precise in terms of like I want to see these requests displayed on the screen um, and I want to use a bunch of different criteria to figure out what I want on there um, just the the kind of um, more advanced than just looking up a, you know at a patron or you know an item or whatever so All right, I'll, I'll follow up on that one. Um, so Folio already has the concept of tags to allow us to put notes on things and fa file them and pass them from one person who's working with a record to another. Um, but one of the items that I believe has just been formally okayed for version one release, though late in the process, will be a workflow engine. And I'm really excited about the idea of being able to use, have a tool that's going to let me create kind of macros within the system so that I can work to push things from one state to another in an automated way that I can predict. Um, I'm very excited about it and I'm very excited about the way that's going, that's going to make my life easier down the road. Quite simply, I'm looking forward to um, actually seeing some live screens of courses and being able to, uh, you know, walk through um, besides just screenshots on, on courses. Um, so, so I'm at that level right now. For my part, I'm most interested, there's a lot of features that the loan subgroup has been discussing um, over the past, I guess, six months, um, really. And um, finally, some of them are able to be pushed off into development because things like fines and fees are now, um, are now a reality. And so being able to now say an item is declared lost and things like that can finally uh, be moved into development. So like Anya, I'm looking forward to seeing things get from mock up into um, the, the, folio, the folio system. Um, and then I think also we'll be discussing things like um, overrides and error messages. And again, kind of those exceptions to the rule, what happens when things don't go perfectly and being able to address those in a way that's user friendly and that allows for staff to be able to make exceptions when necessary. Um, being able, and setting up that way that makes sense and hopefully isn't um, terribly complicated is something that we'll be discussing going forward. 
Okay, I don't see any further questions or comments. So I'm going to conclude today's forum on what's new in resource access. You can continue the conversation at the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using hashtag Folio Forum. Uh, a recording of today's forum will be posted on YouTube on the Open Library Foundation channel, and uh, we would welcome you to subscribe to that channel. Just go to YouTube and search Open Library Foundation, and you'll see um, all of our past uh, forums and, and other content there as well. If you have feedback on this forum or have an idea for a future forum, please contact the facilitators at facilitators at olay-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Thank you again to all of our speakers and to everyone who asked questions. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone.